Hello and welcome to the war. And I'm going to dedicate this video to my great Auntie Mildred, who died on well early hours of the twenty first. She is what well, was my mother's sister's husband's mum. So you can go into all sorts of the rules of whether or not I should have called her my great aunt or not, but yeah. Ladies of a certain generation in my family, they're the great aunts. All the other ones are the great uncles. Some you know, guys are great uncles. You know, you have your uncle's aunts, it's it's how we have always worked as a family. It's how you show respect. She was an absolute superstar. She died aged a hundred years old. Think about that. A hundred years old. Born in... 1922. Not far off our 101st birthday. She served in the Women's Royal Air Force. Or Royal Auxiliary Air Force. In World War II. She was a radar operator. At one point, when she was working on an airfield, and she'd been transferred there to help with the air traffic control, I think. When, just before the planes were supposed to come in and uh, come into land, they realised some bombs had come down on the field, and she went out and marked them, her and the other girls. No one else was free to do it. Everyone else was doing, uh, was busy doing things, so uh, and couldn't. But firefighting and all sorts of things, and there were planes inbound. So the air traffic controllers got little flags. I don't know where they got little flags from. She always just described them as little flags, so... I never asked more information. She wasn't offering more information. And marked all the bombs. So that none of the planes landing could see them. And none of the planes hit the sort of mines, bomb things that have been dropped on the field. Her husband, Uncle Harold, used to spend hours with me on model railways. He was amazing at the electricians. Electric, sort of, so doing the sort of that sort of work. But he always used to say, in electricals, but uh, he always used to say that she was far better than he would ever be. She was very good at electronics. She used to repair her own radio right up until... I think the first time she actually sent her radio to be repaired by someone else, it came to me, and I was about 20 at the time. So that must be... That's not that long ago in the scheme of things of her life. She is a lovely lady. I know, I can guarantee it'll be a very big funeral. <clears throat> a very big one. Hoping it takes place before I go to Australia. <sighs> James Bookplug. But no, today's topic is learning from war, and how do navies learn from war? Well, depends. If they're participating in it, they have all the information generated, and that's what they get the information from. They're basically they're generating information as they go. And they might well also have interrogations of prisoners, espionage information, all sorts of information coming from your side that they'll be functioning into it. 
But if a navy is not part of a war, they will probably be looking for both open official sources and clandestine unofficial sources of information so they can get as much information as they want, as they can. Those will include official histories published by the participants. These can be direct government publications and collections, but also can include autobiographies, biographies, newspaper accounts, anything, eyewitnesses, and its own witness testimony, anything they can get their hands on, they will grab. They will hoover it up. They will literally have a staff whose job it is to hoover that information up. If you consider the modern age, with the current war we've got going on in Ukraine, you will have officers whose job it is, and I'm not saying, I, 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 I don't know them, but I'm sure there are them in pretty much every navy in the world, who are sitting watching social media. And they will have tracked down the accounts they need to follow. They are probably not following the official per official or personal accounts or anything like that. They will have an account more likely set up to follow. And this is not because they're trying to be spook spook or anything like that. It's just basic sensible things. If you are trying to gather information and you want it to be accurate as possible, you don't want to reveal to the perhaps the participants that the person observing it is someone observing from point of view of actual of actual need for the information. Because they might start filtering the information you get, they might start adding in extra bias that they're not already adding in, and therefore you need to be clever. Now, you can do this with bots, and I do know a fair number of people who have, how do I put it, experience with developing information gathering bots, but, and bots are sort of little programs, but I also know people who, when they've been using those for academic purposes, have found that they tend to bring in a huge mammoth amount of data that you don't actually need. So, I wouldn't be surprised if there is still more human involvement than non-human involvement. Then you have, of course, naval attaches. Naval attaches are people who are literally stationed there. You might even be able to station the attaches as observers. I'm going to be using the Russo-Japanese War as the example through this video of talking about how the Royal Navy integrated information, how they did that, because A, it happened roughly 120 years ago, so you know what, I can uh, get away with having uh, with discussing that without anyone being really upset with me. I don't think I'm going to be giving away any secrets, but the principles and method some of the methodologies, in fact a lot of the methodologies still exist to this day. Found a sign unofficial sources, in intelligence officers, observer ships. Can you imagine the Royal Navy with all the ships they had around the world didn't have some ships paying very close attention to the Russian fleet the whole way it went? And the Japanese. Now, how close you want to get to the battle is up to uh, you. But, um... You can spot a lot. But there again, the Royal Navy didn't really worry about having people observing too close to the battle for us, the Japanese war, because they tend to have people on the Japanese flagships. Naval attaches. <laughs> Personnel exchange, i.e. inviting officers to come and teach in academies. This is the age-old methodology. And by the way, if you want to realize how old this was. Scipio Africanus and Hannibal actually met. They met when one was on a diplomatic, uh, one was doing a diplomatic visit on behalf of the Roman Empire and the other one was teaching and training the local armies in a foreign state. That's where two of the most famous generals of their era met each other.
in a completely different end of the Mediterranean. So how do you learn from something like the bombardment of Port Arthur? Well, believe it or not, this goes a lot into the Royal Navy's design of Scarpa Flow. And selection of Scarpa Flow. They're looking for a place which is both easy to secure, but also easy to see the enemy coming. You can't really... Especially as they originally designed it when they are not worried about submarines. It has many, many entrances and exits. Once they start to be worried about submarines, oh my lord, those entrances and exits collapse down. But! It is a major part of the Royal Navy and its efforts in selection is avoiding a similar scenario as Port Arthur. Because Port Arthur got sealed in, noticed the high ground around them. Okay, this is not a good place to have a naval base. You need to find somewhere of securing your fleet so the enemy can't do to you what the Japanese have done to the Russians at Port Arthur. It's not, how do I put this politely, for lack of trying by the Russian, uh, Russian forces, but the fact is, the Russians had fallen for far too many ruses of the Japanese, Japanese involved in it. In fact, and even when the battle begins in February, it's less than a month, well, just a little bit over a month, actually. It's the 10th of March. It starts on the 8th and 10th of March. The Japanese managed to send a ruse using their destroyers to get the Russians to come charging out after them. And this, the Russians fall for this because the Russians don't have control of the high ground. By this point, they don't have a good vision of what's going on around them. So they don't see where the Japanese are lying in wait. They don't see it. So you need to pick and be very careful about your sighting of your fleet base. The Royal Navy already pretty much decided on Scarpa Flow, but basically the bombardment of Port Arthur confirmed it and made them adjust some of their plans. Next phase. It's not really an either or scenario, it's an often a bow scenario. Get their own history written. Now, I have a good example here. I have volume two, but there's also volume one running around here somewhere, of Maritime Operations in the Russo-Japanese War by Julian Corbett. This is an official history of the Russo-Japanese War, written with access to as many sources the Royal Navy could get a hold of. Not published for about 70 years because it's entirely written for the Royal Navy's own consumption. And again, as I've said before, you can pretty much tell the prominent historian, the, the prominent, they are usually going to be prominent, very expert historians who have been tapped on their shoulder to write such a history. You know why? They'll be keeping their mouths shut at the moment. There'll be some, you can tell, if you're looking at the Ukraine war, if you're wondering, well, this this historian isn't saying anything, or this eminent professor isn't saying anything, and you might think, well, I, I, I tweet at them, and, you know, I send the information, I keep... They're not responding about the Ukraine war. Odds are they've been told they might end up be, uh, being asked to do that. So they just won't comment. Or if they do comment, they will comment so blandly that no one will pick up on it. That it will never be a factor. And that's how it works. And you do that because that gives you... How do I put this? The historian might pick up on something you don't. 
They are outside of the pure naval culture. They are a random brain going through it, and they're not that expensive. So you have them quietly go through all the information. Quietly produce that book. They'll have to be paid well for it. By pay well, I mean, usually the reward is a, oh, oh you've been nominated for a knighthood for services to history. Again. <laughs> Not saying you can work out who has written well, what and when, but if you go through the honors list of academics, you could, you have a, a jolly good idea uh, in the UK. And a few other ones as well, where they get, you know, straight, they, they suddenly have less trouble getting grants from a government or something. Well, paying them directly would reveal what they were doing, but there are ways of, and ways and ways of doing these things. And again, this is nothing secret. Please note, if anyone believes this is a secret, you have never sat down in a university common room and listened to the conversations going on. Because whilst they might never talk to the press about it, by the lord do they love to gossip. Then you have staff appreciation. Now, this is where you have staff officers. Come for all the information, uh, comb for all the ga information gathered. It's supposed to be comb, C-O-M-B. Put together a combined report that goes to the various heads of the department, and those various heads of the department will read the whole report, but they'll have sections they can give off copies of to their subordinates. And basically, this is an appreciations. Which means there are different... Yeah, and I'm being very careful to not get into specific phraseology because almost every Navy I work with, even within NATO, and I have chatted out with a lot of them, and this week I will be meeting even more Naval officers at the Defence Leaders Conference, which is a lovely thing to go to in Farnborough, by the way. Really cool. Um... They will have their different phraseology they will use for it, every single one. Unless this week, this will come out the week after it, so last week I'll lament a lot of them when you see this video. And they'll go through and they'll digest it. And at every level, notes will be made, and the notes will be passed up. And they might make revisions to the actual report because of those notes, because of the ideas. They might not. There might be a note go back down going, what? Um, have you been drinking before making comments on reports? At which point the message might go back up about um, four bottles of iron brew. Try six. It might improve your quality. It happens. So what was the big thing from the Russo-Japanese War that really drew the British attention? It was this. It sounds strange, but it was this. You see, people think about the Russo-Japanese War and think about the information the Royal Navy gained from it to fight World War I. True, that did have a factor. But what the Royal Navy was more thinking about was its long-range deployments. And this is what drove, to an extent, its basing strategy, its base development strategy, its approach to Freetown, Sierra Leone, and various other places around the world, its development of its fuel supplies and caches of supplies of fuel in the 1920s and 30s all comes back to studies which were originally done into how the frick did the Russian Navy actually manage to keep their ships going long enough to get them around the whole of Africa and Asia through the Mediterranean and actually meet up there. How? It's a feat. If the Royal Navy could have got their hands on Rosonetsky and actually brought him to the UK to teach them how he managed it, they would have. If they could have got him, his chief of logistics, his chief, uh, chief of staff, and every other staff officer involved in it that, uh, that, could have done, that could have got hold of, they would have brought them. Why? Because they know how bad the Russian fleet is. They've been looking at it for years. There had been a video that will come out last week when I've basically discussed such numbers. The Russian fleet is not well supplied, it's not well resourced, it's in a lot of trouble. 
the fact is, they get there, though. That's a shock. Honestly, the British were expecting them to break down somewhere slightly south of Aden. If they got that far. I'm fairly certain there were a lot of bets going on as to whether or not the Channel Fleet would end up having to tow them into port. The British weren't expecting to fight a battle with them over the Dogger Bank incident. They're expecting them to have to do a... Well, to be honest, a mercy, a mercy mission of rescue. You think the Kuznetsov steaming around today is a worry? Well, that's nothing compared to some of these ships. There were honest reports going back from the Royal Navy going, We couldn't tell whether it was under power or on fire. We think it might have been Russian. We're not sure. It was basically a moving, a moving cloud of smoke. They're impressed that Rosensky gets the fleet there. Okay, it then disintegrates in the battle, but honestly, they're expecting to disintegrate on him, you know. Denmark Straits, probably, knowing that lot. This is the reality of it. So, after you've done written all these reports, after you've got a lovely documents produced, and everyone's read them and thought about it, they start producing theories, ideas. Now, these are lessons learned, are considered theories, until you can replicate them. These days, that would be probably by computer simulations. But, next phase for that is testing. A long time, it's nail exercises. To test out the ideas, even today, when a lot of simulations have been done, as realistic as possible exercises will be carried out to try and iron out those ideas. Because sometimes, something can work great on paper, it can even work fine on a computer, and then you can get actual people involved with it, and it can go completely wrong. And it's either the procedures for what you're planning on doing are wrong, they miss out on the realities of dealing with humans versus computers, or there are other issues. Usually, it's geographical factors. I, ocean, don't like to play. Or rather, ocean, when it plays, plays for keeps. And it's always playing for keeps. But, again, this is when you'll see the large fleet problems, the big exercises. So, in the nicest way, things like the Russo-Japanese War, the information we processed between, over the next, it would have been processed over the 18, next, uh, following 18 months, it would probably have made it into exercises by about... It ends in 1905... Probably exercised by about 1908, being exercised and tested, as in major fleet problems. But that doesn't end there, because it does, can't. She looks lovely, doesn't she, in Mikasa? The only surviving British built battleship. Slowly, thanks to your support, I'm ticking off a number of the things I want to visit in this world. HMS Vampire. Going to be ticked off. HMS CSI Hyda. Ticked off last year. Mikasa. Up there. Top 5. Midway is one of the other in the top 5. A good ship to see. It would be. Final phase. Translate the results into courses that can be taught to the wider Navy, perhaps disseminated in ways that don't automatically reveal where they came from. It's where exercises help, as credit can be awarded appropriately. Basically, if you've got the information from clandestine means, and you need to be polishing in the whole navy, that means it's going to get out somewhere. So you need to try and basically cover up your source. So if you can go, well, this destroyer captain tried this idea, which they had in this exercise, and it worked out well, so we're going to be copying this idea into the rest of... 
we all have a rough idea it didn't come from there, but that's what we're going with. And it's the same with fighter maneuvers, it's the same with everything. Exercises are a great cover because, oh, you know what? That person had an idea. And you can tell that the idea came from them because we're giving them credits! Yeah. They're getting the credit. Now, sometimes they do. Sometimes that credit is honestly earned. Sometimes, maybe not. But the thing is, doesn't matter. You can't tell without doing a lot of investigative work. And the raw the navies involved, well, the Royal Navy, US Navy, Marine Nationale, they are never going to tell you. And there's constant reconsideration. Don't expect any idea to survive on challenge for long. It won't. It really won't. So that leads us to the Battle of Tsushima. This battle has a huge impact on many, many navies. But the really important thing about this battle that's often forgotten is that because of Lisa, navies had changed to worry about forward fire and rams and all those systems. The Battle of Tsushima changes it to worrying about long-range fire. Because the systems were already coming. That was already going to be there. But this showed the way. And the fact is, an admiral with a very large shadow showed it was the way. When he decided to not get into 6 inch gun range, not get into short range of his guns until he'd already smashed the enemy fleet. And yes, he's helped by the fact that they're completely falling apart, and he knows that, but that's why he does it. Think about it. If they'd been fully worked up, free of transports, had been mechanically as sound as they were going to be, He couldn't have held them at range. They have some ships in there which can do 19 plus knots when they're fully worked up. Those ships had resulted in the Royal Navy building the Duncan class and various other classes of fast battleship because they could do 19 knots. But with them being damaged, he can keep them at range. He can concentrate his fire, and he can methodically work his way through the fleet, dismantling it at long range and protecting his own ships from the devastating shorter range fire. Especially from ships of theirs which were French inspired designs which were designed around such short range fire. So, how had he learnt all that? He'd studied it. Now, one of the interesting things that comes up quite often is the amount of people who quote James at me, or various other Brassies, etc. Brassies tend to be slightly more reliable. James, to an extent, has a flair for their writing. So they will say some things. And some of the things include, and I had this comment earlier, let me go find a comment. Ah, yes. In, as G.D. Hum put it, this was in his new newspaper column. Uh, the Congo, from all accounts, appears to be doing remarkably well for her trials. She is very much the last word in battle cruisers. Really? Well, there's HMS Hood, which comes afterwards. You can't really have a last word in battle cruisers. It's always hyper. The moment anyone writes the last word in something, it's hyperbole, because you can't. As long as humanity carries on. Though as her armour is thicker than that of many dreadnought battleships and armour much more powerful, it looks as though the battle cruiser definite classification had already outworn its usefulness. 
Incidentally, it may be mentioned that Japanese ships are now classed as a unit on a unique system, which is a good deal better than most, or would be, if it not differs so much from what is generally accepted. Yeah, um, that's not really the case. It's a nice thing to say, and it's going to sell a lot of copies of the newspaper in America, and it's going to make a lot of various options for selling ships to in shipyards, but... Um, the Japanese were not on a new unique case, and the Congos were not unique. The Congos were in many ways a continuation of the ideas which had come out with the Queen Marys and Tigers. In terms of battle cruisers, in one word. You always have to remember, again, the Congos are, to an extent, kind of like the Germans. And the Japanese and the Germans have similar scenarios when they're producing battle cruisers. Because, like in the Battle of Toshima, where the, cru the armored cruisers... The Japanese can't afford to have eight battleships and also afford their cruisers. So they buy four battleships and four large armored cruisers. And the jo their job is to assist each other. And that's what they do. They operate and they assist each other. It's the 4-4 it's the plan. Then it becomes an 8-8 plan. So the Japanese decide that their battleships, their battle cruisers, their armored cruisers, are always going to have to be slightly tougher because they might end up having to fight in the battle line to assist their battleships to stop their battleships being overwhelmed. It's the same with the Germans, okay? Against the Royal Navy, against the larger numbers, they will need them in a battle line. And their purpose is not to win in the battle line. Please note it. They are not armoured to win. They are not a fast battleship. They're not armoured to fight in the battle line. They are an improved battle cruiser. They are armoured with the extent they can be so they can survive for long enough, survive for long enough to stop the enemy being able to double up. And the aim is that their battleships will wipe out your battleships that they're fighting, whilst your battleships that are fighting their battlecruisers will win against their battlecruisers, but it'll take long enough that by the time they've won, their battleships are now free to come and bash you up. That's the plan. And yeah, it might work, it might not work. But the idea is it causes enough damage and enough losses to you that you don't want to come and fight them. It's a risk fleet. It's the same strategy as risk fleet. I know, lots of people like to believe risk fleet is this strategy which only the Germans come up with. No, lots of navies are using it. It's just how they present it. You see, when you talk about it as a risk fleet strategy and you talk about it and you're focusing it on the Royal Navy and you're actually pretty much publicly saying it's the Royal Navy, you are turning into a strategy of aggression. You're weaponizing it in that regard, to use that phraseology. But if you use it as a case of, we're going to build this and this because we can't afford to do anything else, well, it's very hard for anyone to argue that's an aggressive move. Other than if you're America versus Japan, because you don't always view anything they're building as aggressive, because um, in that period you are sort of mentally dealing with the fact that you went and beat them up forced your way in, and expected them to become, basically, from that point onwards, almost a um, a protectorate, something you were going to have power and influence over. And instead, they have reacted by turning into a snarling tiger in the corner, which is wounded, but is still looking pretty nasty. And you're going, I, 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 yeah, I whacked you on the head with a club, but I didn't expect you to be upset about it. It's fun. It is fun. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And, um... I'm not going to really put a question at the end of this one. Because I think I've probably given you enough ideas to go off and questioning. But I wouldn't be surprised if a few of you want to go and wander around Twitter now to have a look at various... of Twitter and Mastodon and various places, social medias, to look at the accounts of various uh, senior academics. And seeing exactly what they have been saying or not saying about war in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Take care and have a nice evening. It's going to be the fleet of War Imperium Warhammer 40k next week. Sheesh kebab.